there, there is sort of the um, legacy of the, the myth of the model minority in that there still is, I think, a prevailing general belief in many of the institutes that Asians really don't have that many problems. And that, so the inertia has to do with that it's not that studying Asians is not important or studying culture is not important. It has to do with the notion that there are more important things to study. And with limited funding, we're going to give priority to those more important things. Asian Americans, I think, have a, 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 a double challenge in the sense that there's that inertia in general towards cultural diversity, but there is the other issue that um, uh, Asians don't have that many problems. And uh, despite evidence of the immigrant paradox, which is that the health and mental health of immigrants, once they get to the United States, actually becomes worse. And so, you know, you would think that this would generate an interest in, well, if, if people are coming in with fairly good health, let's do some research so we can keep them at that level versus allow them to acculturate and, or assimilate and acculturate and then uh, where their health becomes actually, uh, where their, their, their mental health and, and health status actually deteriorates. Now, um, so, so, and I'll give you an example. In the, in, in the 1990s, uh, one of the institutes, I won't name him, came out and said, uh, we want more research on ethnic minority populations. So they had a specific RFA looking at treatment for a particular certain disorder uh, that was, the RFA wanted to have uh, the uh, research to focus on ethnic minorities who had this disorder, okay, and, and how to treat this disorder. But in the RFA it said, Asian Americans have such a low prevalence of this disorder, such that there seems to be no need to, 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 for research on this population. It actually said it in the RFA, you know, and, and clearly at that time there was evidence that Asian Americans had lower rates of that disorder, but that doesn't mean it's not important to study for that population. In fact, you know, there's, uh, we, we can go back to some of the earlier research on alcoholism on, on women. Yes, women always, you know, to this day have lower rates of alcoholism, but what the research was finding in those days is that when a woman developed alcoholism, they, the consequences of ha having, of becoming an alcoholic, or being an alcoholic, was actually greater for women. So. Nobody looked at this issue, obviously, for Asians. So even though Asians may have lower rates of a certain disorder, what's the consequences? What's the, what's the burden of that illness on that person? Many times people do not examine the burden. They, they examine the prevalence and they assume that, that the burden is the same. And clearly some of the research shows that, at least for certain diseases and certain disorders, the burden is not the same for, for different cultural groups. What the research has been finding is that Asians do have lower prevalence of certain types of mental health problems, um, for example, depression, anxiety disorders. Uh, but simply having lower prevalence doesn't mean that um, uh, they have less of a need for services because what's happening is that even the people, our research is documented, even the people who actually have a mental health problem are not coming in for treatment at the rates that you would expect them given uh, the rates that you see in the general population. So when they do come in for, for help, for mental health services, the, our, some of our other studies are showing that when they do come in, they're more severely disabled. Because, um, and, and so a recent study again showed that when we compare Asian inpatients with white inpatients, so these are people who clearly have to be hospitalized for their problems, that Asian inpatients actually are more severely disabled than white inpatients. So we are, even within a severely disabled subpopulation, we have Asians having more chronicity, more severity, and largely it's because, again, they seem to be see, delay, have major delays in seeking help. So by the time they do come in, their problems have really exacerbated to the point where they're actually more severely, have more severe problems than even people who are comp uh, comparable to them in terms of their mental health status, such as inpatients. Even though a person comes in and they're severely disabled, that uh, there's also research that, sh you know, so, so the, you have all this research sort of converging on this major challenges that we have in Asian American mental health. There's also research showing is that they leave treatment early. They don't, in other words, they don't stay long enough to take advantage, to benefit from the psychiatric or psychological services they would be receiving if they, if they, uh, once they've come into treatment.
And so, so, so now you have this issue of, well, what's going on in therapy or what's going on in medication sessions where an Asian patient is uh, disinclined to stay in, in treatment. Uh, and, and so that is now where much of our center's focus is, 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 is what, what's going on between the care provider, the physician, the psychologist, so social worker and the Asian American patient or client that is uh, creating certain dynamics that where they're leaving, you know, the research showing that they're still leaving treatment earlier than other patients. Yeah, so the, the center is focused on um, three areas of research. The first is uh, what, what uh, is on therapist factors. In other words, what, what, what kinds of therapist behaviors are really uh, tied to uh, clinical uh, to better clinical outcomes uh, that 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 supposedly uh, reflect culturally competent care, and, and so uh, we have one study that that looks at the attitudes that therapists have towards cultural competence, about cultural competence, uh, their experience in cultural diversity trainings, etc. But then the bottom line is, are these pa these therapists who are more oriented in that way? Do they actually have better outcomes with their patients? That's never been tested, and so that study is, is wrapping up. Okay. We have another study that looks at, well, how do we adapt the most prevalent form of psychological treatment is cognitive behavior therapy. How do we adapt it to really best treat Asians with depression? And so we, you know, we're, uh, we've, we have an in, uh, these uh, in-depth interviews with clinicians on actually what kinds of adaptations they make. But then we have other studies looking at certain, di certain types of cultural factors that we believe um, mitigate uh, or create problems in therapy uh, for therapists, uh, regardless of whether they're using CB, uh, cognitive behavior therapy or whether they're using uh, psychodynamic therapy or whatever. And, um, um, so much of our research is focused on these cultural factors. Now what do I mean by cultural factors? Cultural factors are the way that we have sort of examined this is, is um, these cultural tendencies for people to behave in a certain way that uh, may affect their response to treatment. Let me give you an example. Is some of, much of our work, uh, much of my work is focused on face loss, face loss and shame. And people have written clinically about shame and face loss for, for a long time, but there's been very little empirical work actually looking at this. So our center has sort of tr taken this approach, is that one of the problems is that the research has documented some really interesting culture variations, like you know Asians being more family-oriented, high on filial piety, um, uh, not as knowledgeable, not as mentally uh, health literate. In other words, not knowledgeable about mental health issues, right? <clears throat> and, but it's unclear when you look at that how you actually work with the patient in, in session. And so we're trying to look at cultural factors that really would affect the in-session behavior of both the client as well as the therapist. Now face loss is clearly one of those. And some of our recent research, uh, again, published in the Asian American Journal of Psychology, shows that when, first of all, Asian Americans tend to um, um, be more, much more concerned about face loss than, than, than white Americans. And that, you know, that, that's not surprising. But very few studies have actually assessed face loss or face concern. And what we find is that when people have higher face concern, they don't disclose much, they tend to disclose less about their personal life, about their intimate uh, uh, relationships, about their personality, across the, they, they basically disclose less across the board. So now we have evidence that here's an, a very important cultural factor, face concern, but not just that it differentiates Asians from whites, but that this factor is tied to a critical process in psychotherapy, which is self-disclosure. There is no physician, there is no psychologist, no social worker who can help anybody if the patient does not tell them eventually what's bothering them. So self-disclosure is like the you know, first building block of a good treatment, whether it's medical or psychological. I mean, you know, if you go in and, uh, you know, I just uh, had an incident, uh, was told to me, you know, uh, elderly uh, Japanese-American woman um, had a lump in her breast. She didn't tell her doctors for 
months, and of course it had mis mis metastasized by then, and and so she, you know, she died. And so, but she didn't self-disclose. So, the, you know, you can't you can't do uh, X-rays of every woman. <laughs> In other words, we you have to self-disclose, and so. Uh, and I'm sure face, uh, it seems that face issue was a major issue for her. And so, um, but, so, but then it goes back to, well, how can you then deal with face loss? And that's where we're at now, is that when you look at the training models in psychiatry, psychology, social work, many of the training models do not address cultural issues head on, such as face loss. So I, whenever I give talks, and nobody has, you know, Nobody, I should have some kind of uh, incentive where, you know, if you, if you can actually show me that face loss is addressed in supervision, I'll give you $1,000 because I would never lose that money. Um, and I, every talk I give, I ask, uh, particularly if it's a clinically based audience, have you ever been trained to address face loss or face concern? How do you know your, another question, how do you know your patient is concerned about face? We can't assume that all Chinese or all Asians are, yes, our research shows they score higher on our face loss measure, but that doesn't mean that every Chinese patient is, is, is concerned about face. So how do you know they're concerned about face, you know? And so have you been trained to detect that? And, 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 and of course, you know, the, the answer usually is no. And, and you know, what we're showing is that, look, if you don't address this issue, or, or somehow if you're not aware of it, uh, the patient may not be telling you as much as they could be, you know. And so, um, so anyway, that's an example. Face loss obviously is just one issue, but what we're trying to do is now take the psychological elements that sort of map onto cultural differences, but the other requirement is that that psychological element has to be related to a critical process in psychotherapy, right, or therapy, and for it to really be useful for, for us to, to guide us in, in, in terms of doing culturally competent work or care. Uh, so another factor, I'll just give you real quickly one, another factor. Another factor is that in most psychotherapy, whether it's done by psychiatrists, psychologists, or social workers, or, or nurses, is the, when you look at what's done in cognitive behavior therapy or, or insight-oriented therapy, a lot of what the, patient, the, the therapist is trying to do is teach the patient or give the patient experiences so they can handle their emotions in a different way, handle their anxiety in a different way, handle their depression in a different way, handle their trauma in a different way. So a lot of it is what we call emotion regulation. And uh, this is not work done by us, but by some other groups. Uh, there's been some fascinating uh, work done on cultural variations and how the people regulate their emotions. And much of it actually has been done on Asian women, not Asian men. And so. And I, because I, the reason I say that is because I think Asian men actually would show even greater differences. <laughs> but uh, uh, so what they found, for example, is that bicultural Asian women compared to white women will actually emotionally suppress their emotions more. Okay, but what they're finding is that when Asian women emotionally suppress, it's actually related to better, better adjustment. When white women suppress, it's similar to what we, we see in the movies. If someone sits on their emotions, they get worse. And so yes, when white women suppress, it's related to worse adjustment. But the relationship is totally opposite for, white, for Asian American women. So now, here's a therapist trying to get, to, you know, think of uh, what we do in psychotherapy. Here's a therapist trying to get the person to manage their emotions, etc. And to sort of emote, you know, a lot of, for example, insight or oriented therapy focuses on catharsis, and so you know the the uh, the expression and venting of, of these pent up emotions. But the research shows that maybe for Asian American women, particularly maybe particularly for Asian immigrant women and maybe immigrant men, this venting actually is not related to better mental health. <laughs> it's actually reverse. It's inversely related to to mental health. And so here's another impasse. And then the question again I say in my talks is, have you ever been trained to handle cultural variations in emotion regulation? Of course not. So the field of cultural competent care and, and the research on, on cultural competence is, is very exciting, but we have so much to do. And I think sometimes we're going down, we're going down some paths that sort of uh, take us away from some of these major issues or, or some of these issues that actually could have greater payoff. Um, so, so, you know, when you read textbooks and when people come in and do trainings with residents or with um, uh, 
uh, psychological psychology interns or social work interns, a lot of the focus is they'll bring a talk speaker and says, "Oh, so this is the way you treat African Americans. This is the way you treat Mexicans. This is the way you treat Asians," and they sort of, you know, talk about the way that the textbooks and and all the 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 uh, uh, handbooks on multicultural counseling and therapy talk about is you know how do you treat Asians versus whites versus and 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 so yes they talk about these differences uh, but they don't really get into the guts of what you do in psychotherapy you know it's sort of these general sort of uh, tendencies but then as one clinician astutely said yeah I so what if if so what if I know an Asian American patient is more from from more collectivistic culture how does that affect his therapy, his behavior towards me as a therapist when I'm trying to treat him for major depression? What, what do I attend to that makes me better able to handle cultural issues that may affect my treatment with him? And so our center is really trying to you know, address that challenge by looking at cultural factors, but not just cultural factors, but cultural factors that empirically or some seem to be tied to some, a critical process in psychotherapy like face loss uh, or I mean I'm sorry face loss would affect um, like uh, self-disclosure which is a critical process therapeutic alliance which is another critical process uh, differences in the way people cope with emotions is going to affect uh, the way that we teach people how to regulate their emotions which is another critical task in psychotherapy obviously the center is built on the great work of many people who've preceded us or, and who are currently still contributing to the field. But, but what I also try to do in our work is bring in other people's work that's not necessarily focused on culture. Because sometimes I think that work really can inform our work and, and make it better. Uh, so for example, um, another approach that we're using is uh, Alan Kasdan's approach to what he calls social validity. And his notion is that if something is socially valid, so he was talking in terms of just social validity that it, it has to be valid to that particular patient or patient group. And so he wasn't talking about culture, but he was talking about socially, basically he was talking about culture because in order for something to be meaningful or valid, it has to make sense in their social context. So what, what does he mean by social validity? So he said, look, social validity has three aspects. If something is socially valid, the patient has to believe that there is a problem <laughs> and that sometimes is already a major challenge because either people are in denial or people just don't believe it's that much of a problem. Uh, second, social validity has to do with is the, is the treatment or technique or the approach you're using to treat them, is that socially acceptable to them? You know, sometimes it's not. And uh, like even in medicine, you know, disrobing, all these things, is that socially acceptable? Not to certain people from, particularly women from certain cultural groups. Um, so how do you really negotiate that? You just tell them to disrobe and just try to use your authority as a physician. Well, a lot of times that works, but it may make them so uncomfortable they may not come back, right? Um, and last one, which I think is really, is that he says for also something to be socially valid, the outcome, the outcome of the treatment has to be valued by that patient, valued by that patient. So we know, for example, that in many East Asian cultures, you know, particularly with strong Buddhist and Confucian uh, underpinnings, that the notion of distress is, is many times processed differently in the sense that many cultural groups believe that there's no, it's not a problem to be in distress. In other words, in fact, the Buddhists have a saying, life is suffering. Life, so life itself is just suffering. And so it's a normal part of life. So when you normalize suffering and the psychological distress, then many times when physicians focus on depression and anxiety, the patient may not think this is a problem. Now, for mental health practitioners, this is inconceivable that we said, well, how can they believe it's not a problem? It's not that it doesn't affect them. Depressions clearly can have right, major effects on their work, etc. It's just that they don't believe it's a problem. So that may be another reason why people aren't seeking help. But the other thing is when we, they come in, we ask them to open up and, 
tell us all their family secrets and all their personal secrets, which may generate a lot of face loss. So the second part of social validity may also be a challenge is that the techniques we use in psychotherapy may be not socially acceptable to that person. An analogy I give to a lot of trainees is that how many times have you really worked with a patient, particularly if they're from, from an Asian American patient, and you, you, know, you have them tell, tell, them, tell you all their problems, and, and you think that's a great session because they've really been forthcoming with, with telling you what's really bothering them. And then you are surprised because they only stay for two sessions or three or, or one session. I said, you know, this could be happening is the person comes in and because as clinicians we're trained to elicit self-disclosure, so we're masters at getting people to open up. But sort of using a surgery analogy is that if you open them up, did you close them back up? And a lot of times we don't do that in psychotherapy. We just say, oh, I did a great job because look, she told me her utmost secrets and her, all of her anger towards her father. <laughs> But the patient may come out of the session and say, oh my God, what did I just do? I just caused great shame to my family because I sold them down the river by dissing on my father and by revealing all the secrets of the family. And so, again, you know, the, Kazan really wasn't focused on ethnic culture, but his social validity model really drives a lot of our work in terms of how we address cultural competence.